get ready to delve into the powerful speech by Jeffrey Sachs at the UN. Today we're immersing ourselves into his insightful words, dissecting every key point to uncover the gems of wisdom. Brace yourselves for an incredible journey of knowledge and inspiration. If you're new here, don't forget to hit that like button and stick around after Sachs' speech for an in-depth analysis. Let's dive in and be prepared to be blown away. To the world, world food system. It's based on large multinational companies. It's based on private uh, profits. It's based on a very, very low measure of international transfers to help poor people, sometimes none at all. It's based on extreme irresponsibility of powerful countries with regard to the environment. And it's based on a radical denial of rights of poor people, as we just heard. It's interesting, we asked, we heard from the minister of DRC, what's wrong with your country? Well, we don't even start by saying the King of Belgium created a slave colony for 30 years. The government of Belgium ran the slave colony for another 40 years. The CIA aided your first popular leader, Mr. Lumumba, and then installed another dictatorship for the next 30 years. And then Glencore and others now suck out your cobalt without giving you tax income. We don't reflect on that. We say, what's wrong with you? Why don't you govern properly? And so we have a system, but we need a different system. <laughs> We cannot turn this over to the private sector. We already did about a hundred years ago. Not only to the private sector, to the private sector with the US military behind it. With the defense of these property rights in Mr. the minister of Honduras's country, where United Fruit ran the country for a long time. And their attorney was the foreign minister of the United States, Secretary Dulles, and his brother was the head of the CIA and overthrew the next door neighbor, Mr. Arbenz, to make sure that United Fruit could have its property. So we have a system, but we need a different system. And the different system has to be based on principles of human dignity in the Universal Declaration principles of sovereignty, principles of economic rights, because these are not nice things to do. In 1948, all the government said that food is a right, social protection is a right, not a nice thing, not a pleasant thing, a right. That was 73 years ago. The SDGs are nothing more than our generation's attempt to honor the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I come from a country that not only doesn't care about the world's poor, it doesn't even care about its own poor. One in seven Americans is hungry right now. And they don't care. I mean, the poor people care, but one political party, all it cares about is cutting taxes for the rich and filibustering any solution. So we're in a world that's really tough. The private sector is not going to solve this problem. I'm sorry to say to all of the private sector leaders, behave, pay your taxes, follow the rules. That's what you should do. And what the governments should do is the following. They won't, but they should. First, the G20 should become the G21 by inviting systemically the chairperson of the African Union and the African Union to be the 21st country. The, 20, the European Union is a member of the G20 as the EU. If you add the AU as the 21st for the G21, you add 1.4 billion people to representation at that crucial event. That will change 
decisively the discussion because 1.4 billion people are not at the table for finance right now and they need to be so my first recommendation is the G21 I love the G20 add one seat 1.4 billion people with the AU represented second we need a order of magnitude change of development finance the rich countries just borrowed 17 trillion dollars for covid the poor countries nothing because the rich countries can borrow at zero and the poor countries pay five or ten percent coupon rates or have no access at all so the world exposed its grotesque inequality this past year and a half rich countries didn't say we tighten our belts why don't you my country spent seven trillion dollars of emergency funding not one penny for anybody else by the way seven trillion it didn't even cross the imagination of the u.s congress to include a few crumbs for the rest of the world but the poor countries cannot borrow that's what we should have heard from the world bank I didn't hear that from the World Bank I didn't hear real numbers real numbers are in trillions right now because the world economy is a hundred trillion a year but we don't talk about real numbers but my job all I know in this world is long division divide by a hundred trillion and then see whether you're talking about something real or not so that's the second thing we need massively to increase the lending and borrowing capacity of poor countries at near zero interest rates like the rich countries have then they could get something done by the way for covid vaccines what we really need is for the united states to sit down with china with russia with the european union and the uk one day around the table and allocate these vaccines rather than hoarding them that's all it would take and then we're going to have national pathways this is a wonderful idea but they're going to need financing and so everything that i've been saying i know the numbers that's all i do for 40 years is add up what's missing you want electricity it has to be purchased you want digital access it has to be purchased you want safe water irrigation it has to be purchased this is what i do for a living is add up these numbers and then find out that then somebody makes up something and names one hundredth of what's really needed it's not even hard by the way the imf has done wonderful studies in the last two years showing that we have a financing gap of about 400 to 500 billion dollars a year for the basics for the sdgs they show the gap but they don't nobody comes up with the number the solution which wouldn't be so hard because that's just not a big number it's 0.5 of one percent of world output so if we really care we wouldn't have the g7 saying we love education therefore we're going to give three billion dollars for education that's what they said at the summit but what unesco has shown is that you need at least 30 billion dollars a year minimum but nobody looks at numbers they just make up nice check the box so we need the real numbers of finance to back the national pathways the final thing is we need the un as the core and central institution of this world period because this is the only way we're going to have a civilized world is a strong un and it cannot be that the whole un budget is less than my neighborhood's budget in new york the un core budget this year is three billion dollars new york city's budget is a hundred billion dollars and then we say why don't things work well because the rich are hoarding everything final point rather than our three billionaires going in space well they could go into space and stay there and leave their money behind that would be one idea uh, uh. <laughs>
But another Thanks. idea, another idea is we have 2,775 billionaires on the current list. Their combined net worth, 2,700, is 13.1 trillion dollars. Now I have it on good authority, you don't need more than a billion dollars to be comfortable. But they have an excess of 11 trillion dollars over just the one billion. So we should be taxing that and having a civilized world. Thank you. Jeffrey Sachs. Wow. Wasn't that Jeffrey Sachs speech something else? His energy was absolutely infectious, like a fire igniting passion and inspiration. I couldn't help but feel drawn by his boldness and authenticity. It's like the kind of leadership that we deserve here in Africa. Fearless, passionate, and unapologetic. Sachs spoke straight from the heart. His words fueled by deep-rooted conviction and unwavering determination. It is refreshing to see someone who's done their homework. He's not afraid to speak out and challenge the status quo. We need more leaders like him, willing to shine a light on the truths that often go unnoticed, like the disparity in interest rates between Africa and the West. But Sachs isn't just pointing out problems, he's offering solutions and rallying us to action. It's time for Africa to rise, and with voices like Sachs, we're on the brink of an era of leadership and progress that we've never seen before. Just imagine if our leaders had a chance to hear Jeffrey Sachs' powerful speech. It's like a breath of fresh air, an awakening of the mind. Sachs' words are not just enlightening, they are downright inspiring. It's as if he's speaking directly to our souls, addressing the challenges we've faced for generations. This isn't just good, it's brilliant. And the more voices like his emerge, the brighter the spotlight shines on Africa's struggles. Now, get ready for a breakdown that will leave you hungry for more insights and inspiration. At the UN, on July 27th, 2021, Sachs captivated audiences as he delved into the intricate web of challenges within our global food system. We'll dissect the key points from the dominance of multinational corporations to the urgent need for transformation. Let's unravel the layers of insight and inspiration woven throughout his address. Let's look at dominance of multinational companies. So, Sachs shed light on how large multinational companies drive the global food system, prioritizing private profits over international warfare. He emphasized the alarming disparity in international transfers, revealing a system skewed towards corporate interests. He also went into the necessity for transformation, where he underscored the critical need for a profound transformation in food systems to address the pressing issues at hand. He also highlighted the detrimental effects of colonialism, CIA involvement, and the influence of political parties like the Republicans on food systems, addressing failures through taxation. Sachs advocated for taxing the rich as a means to rectify the failures of privatized global food trading and commodity markets. By calling attention to the UN budget, the role of taxation, he proposed concrete steps towards a more equitable and sustainable food system. His insights challenge us to confront the entrenched inequalities and systemic failures plaguing our global food system. I think it is very important to cite that he did mention some key points that we can take away as Africans and use to our own advantages to drive meaningful change and work towards achieving sustainable development. Let's dive into some of the reactions to Jeffrey Sachs' speech at the UN Food Systems Pre-Summit. Honest and necessary discourse. Viewers appreciated Sachs' candid approach to addressing issues such as market failures in global food trading and commodity markets. For example, Ethical Markets praised Sachs for his forthright account, recognizing the importance of acknowledging these failures. And he also garnered some mixed reactions, with some audience members stunned by his revelations while others found agreement with his points. This mix of surprise and agreement highlights the diverse perspectives among viewers. Let's look at the stimulating conversation and reflection. Overall, Sachs' address sparked significant conversation and reflection on the current state and future of global food systems. His insights prompted viewers to reconsider the complexities of issues like colonialism, CIA involvement, and the role of political parties in shaping food systems. Jeffrey Sachs' speech at the UN Food Systems Pre-Summit ignited a spectrum of reactions, from admiration for his honesty to surprise at the revelations shared. Despite differing viewpoints, one thing is clear. Sachs' words have stimulated important conversations and reflections on the urgent need to transformation within global food systems. And as we continue to dissect and discuss his insights, let's remain committed to fostering positive change 
Now, let's look at Africa's economic rise to freedom. Innovation is the key to Africa's future prosperity, as highlighted by the inspiring stories of entrepreneurs and innovators across the continent. From groundbreaking apps to homegrown car companies, Africa is ripe with potential for innovation-driven growth. Now, let's explore how focusing on innovation can pave the way for a brighter future amidst the challenges facing the continent. Entrepreneurial Success Stories Africa's innovators are breaking barriers and achieving remarkable success. Take for example the entrepreneur who created the lucrative app or the visionary who launched a car company. These success stories serve as a beacon of hope, demonstrating the power of innovation in driving economic growth and prosperity. Despite facing numerous challenges, including economic and infrastructure constraints, Africa has the opportunity to thrive through innovation. By fostering a culture of creativity and entrepreneurship, African countries can harness their untapped potential and chart a path towards sustainable development. Taking an innovative stand holds immense promise for Africa's long-term prosperity. Innovation not only drives economic growth but also empowers communities, creates jobs, and addresses pressing social and economic issues. As Africa confronts its challenges head-on, innovation emerges as a powerful catalyst for progress and prosperity. By embracing creativity, entrepreneurship, and the forward-thinking solutions, Africa can unlock its full potential and shape a future defined by innovation-driven growth. In a world of challenges, one thing remains certain, Africans' potential knows no bounds. With a young and vibrant population, the continent is ripe with opportunities for innovation and growth. Let us embrace a mindset of positivity and hard work as we strive towards a brighter future as Africans. No excuses, just action. It's time to banish excuses and procrastination. As Africans, let's commit to relentless effort and perseverance in pursuit of our dreams. With determination and resilience, we can overcome an obstacle and seize the countless opportunities that lie ahead. Opportunity in adversity. Despite the challenges of securing funding for startups, aspiring entrepreneurs and innovators mustn't lose hope. Countless success stories in Africa demonstrate that passion and hard work can triumph over financial barriers. All it takes is an idea and a willingness to pursue it with unwavering dedication. Africa's rising story. Africa's rise isn't just a possibility, it's an inevitability. With each passing day, we inch closer to realizing our full potential as a continent. By sharing our stories, supporting one another, and fostering a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship, we can accelerate Africa's journey towards prosperity and success. As we embark on this journey of growth and transformation, let us remember to leave excuses behind and embrace the power of hard work and positivity. Africa's story is one of resilience, determination, and endless opportunity. So, let's like, share, and subscribe to spread the message of hope and inspiration. Together, we will rise, and together, but will shape a brighter tomorrow for Africa and beyond. See you in the next adventure.